One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bind them. Needless to say, I just finished rewatching the trilogy last night of Lord of the Rings, so I had to start with a little bit of that. But today, obviously, what we're doing is we're going to take a look at the DF83 version 2, as well as the Niche Duo and the plethora of 83mm burrs on the market. They'll be probably a little more terse than my usual deep dive on each of them because so many reviews have already been posted online, so I don't feel the need to go over kind of the big things that are kind of obvious. We'll go over more so the minutia, my nitpicks, my, you know, enjoyment of the two as well as deep diving on some of these burr options. So let's take a look at these two grinders and figure out which one is my precious. When the Niche Zero was first released some years back, it was kind of the big staple on the home market for uh, introducing single dosing into the home. And over the years, it's, you know, formed a cult following. And I notoriously posted a video where I kind of said I wasn't a huge fan of the Niche Zero and I didn't think it kind of maintained its relevance in 2021, I believe is when I made that video. I will be honest, that made me very biased and made me not want to like the Niche Duo, but we'll get more into that in a bit. I just wanted to say that initial bias because there is one. Niche, right off the bat, it is identical in every way except for size to the original Niche Zero. It is the Zero just supersized. It's like you were at McDonald's and you wanted to supersize it, even though they've kind of banned that in the U.S. because people are getting too much trans fats, if you know what I'm saying. Flat burr grinders were very expensive, very difficult to get your hands on a high quality one unless you were buying something like the Bratz Avario, which still sat at around 500 US dollars. Then you had things coming out like the DF64, the Malkunig X54, and you have, of course, the Eureka series and all these other ones that were, you know, pushing the envelope on flat versus cone burrs. And so over the years, people were realizing that those 63 millimeter Mazarconi burrs were not really providing uh, as much as they wanted for their coffee. So what do I mean by that? They weren't really able to do filter well at all, and that was a huge critique that I had and a lot of users had of the Zero. And also, for its purported use, it wasn't really even that great at that. Yes, it was easy to dial in because the grind consistency is so, so wide that you have kind of a big window in order to hit a decent shot. And so it was easy for first-time users to really dial in their espresso without having to waste a lot of coffee, but they were getting kind of subpar shots. Once they started trying coffee with other grinds, they were realizing the lack that they were experiencing maybe unknowingly. Niche, in order to respond to this over the years, finally came out with something different. And with this, the Niche Duo, duo meaning two, as in two burr sets, not the second iteration, they came out with an idea to kind of hyper-focus one burr set on one style of brewing and another burr set on another style of brewing with a very simple burr changing uh, process. You have the same exact functionality as the Niche Zero. The same workflow and everything that people loved on the original is replicated here. You open this, there's there's a safety switch on the lid. There's a little magnet on the front of the lid in order to just dose in. You close it, then you start the grinder. Now, you have to have the lid shut because there's a safety switch, just like on the original. Sometimes I like to just jam that button because I like hot starting things, but since there's not that uh, little disc, the slow feeding disc in this one as there was on the Zero, it doesn't feed as slowly, so I don't like the cold start as much. But like I said, nothing you can really do because of that safety switch. Now, one of the big worries I've seen online is the weak motor on paper that the Niche Duo has. I believe it's the same motor as the Zero, a 130 watt motor. Uh, and so people are like, how at 83 millimeters are you getting away with that? When you look at these other grinders like the 83, which has a 550 watt motor, when you look at the Bentwood, which has 63 millimeter burrs, not even 83, has a 660 watt motor. When you look at even the DF64, which has a 250 watt motor, how is this massive burr going to be able to not stall and have a long life with such a small motor? Well, the answer is simple. It's a planetary gearbox. If you get a motor with a high RPM and you step it down, you increase the torque exponentially. I was impressed by the high torque on the fellow Opus and made an Instagram video of me grinding unroasted green coffee beans in the Opus, just to kind of showcase the six Newton meters of torque and how impressive it was. What I've been told is it could grind green coffee beans. I didn't try it.
And then people started to showcase the power of this by grinding green and it's tur turned into a thing. Don't grind green coffee, even if you're like trying to showcase the power of your motor, it, don't do that. There's been a big misunderstanding with motors that a bigger number means better, but in all reality, it's how you use the motor. And I think Nisha's has done a good job in how they're using the motor. Now, I can't speak on longevity of the motor. Maybe that will cause an issue in the long run. Uh, it's much easier grinding with 63 millimeter cone burrs than the original Zero. And so I know a lot of those have lasted without an issue, but who knows what'll happen in the long run with 83 mils but I'm not here to be a doomsdayer. I'm just saying it's absolutely sufficient. You are not gonna have any stalling because they have this step down, which you don't actually see in a lot of grinders, unfortunately, because it's a great way to improve your torque with a cheaper motor. So when you open it up, you have the same dialing system as the original niche, which is really granular and really easy to follow. You have all the way up to 70 different numbers, and in between you have little tick marks, so you can be really granular with your dialing. And it has the same little notch right here for you to know where you're lined up at. Now, originally when you bought this, you were you had to receive two different burr sets. So you're essentially paying extra money in order to get two separate burr sets, which you know peeved off a lot of people. The reason for this is because, again, they wanted to target two different styles of brewing. They had a filter burr set from Mazer and an espresso burr set, a bimodal burr set from Mazer. And they gave you this extra burr carrier so that you could swap out the burrs very easily. So you have the burr already mounted on a carrier and swapping it out is super easy again, which we'll show in a little bit. This annoyed a lot of people and they were hoping to just be able to buy it with one burr set or whatever uh, because they didn't want both of those burr sets. They weren't looking to faff around and switch up their burrs. Also ended up reducing the price. Now, personally, I didn't get a refund on the VAT, which was paid based off of the original price. So I was out like, 1250 bucks for this even though it is it's currently priced at 549 pounds which is like 676 us dollars uh, and that doesn't include shipping and then you have your import fees so the price gets up there really quickly especially because they don't work with distributors they only ship out of london people have been asking for them to sell ssp burrs which okay i get i can also understand their stance to not do it because they built this grinder based off of these two burr sets probably never going to sell ssp burrs or any other type of burrs from their company because that would be essentially them having to say, all right, we endorse the use of this product, but right now, if you change out the burrs, other than these two burr sets, you void your warranty. What I can see them selling, which would be an easy thing to sell, are just extra sets of these burr carriers that you yourself could fit SSPs in, and that way, you could just have different burr carriers that you switch out instead of having to unscrew the burrs every time. Some issues immediately that I realized while I was using this grinder. One is they don't have an ionizer or a plasma generator, whatever you wanna call it, in here. Even though it is very efficient, has very low retention, it shoots out even undesirable bits into this and it can get really messy. So you still have a lot of static buildup. And yes, I, I live in Porto, which can be dry some parts of the year, but I'm actually in the wet season right now. It's really humid. It's probably 65% or 70% outside right now. And even still, I have a lot of chaff that will build up, which I'll just show you right now. This is what grinding kind of looks like. I dump in about a 20 gram dose and here we go. Not only do we have a lot of, you know, chaff that has flown onto the grinder that we need to clean out every time we grind, we have a ton of static that's built up in the dosing cup, as you can see all this, all of the chaff on the edges. And because of that, we're creating a more static environment in general. So with every successive grind, if we're doing multiple cups, that static's just gonna keep building and we're gonna keep having more and more mess on the grinder itself. Because there isn't that slow feeding disc, or I, I don't really know how they could put it on this because the way it spins is different from the Zero, but because there isn't something like that, you actually get a lot of popcorning that goes on, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Popcorning will always happen. You're not gonna stop it because of some sort of disc. It's going to always wanna pop out because of the speed of the burrs and the, the desire of the bean to not be crushed. It's like, no, don't crush me, I don't wanna be crushed. Well, you're gonna be crushed. What happens is a lot of times fragments of beans shoot out and get caught up on this little funnel here. And even there, I've seen instances of other people and it's happened to me as well, where these chunks can actually get out from underneath the lid itself. So I was, I'm a big critic of the lid. I, I hated the lid on the Zero and they just replicated it here. It's kind of loose, it rattles, it just feels kind of cheap, plasticky, and it doesn't have a nice seal. So you have like this, I don't know, it just feels kind of cheap and out of place. I've seen some home users, you know, kind of fix this by, uh, by using some sort of silicon 
piece that they found online that they put on the inside here to create kind of a seal with the lid. That also helps stop those fragments from coming out and it keeps a better seal on the lid so you don't have kind of mess falling out of the top when you're grinding. A little bit of that is gonna, is gonna go a long way for you on this. So taking off the top is very easy. You just go coarser and coarser until the top kind of pops off. And there's you know food safe grease around the threads. You wanna make sure that you always have some grease on there. So if over the years you notice it kind of goes away, just reapply some food safe grease to make that dialing experience really nice. And yeah, you're good to go. Next, all you do is you pull out the top burr carrier. It's that easy, just pull it out. They have a sticker where it says set. You always put that in the back middle so that you have consistency there. I currently have the Silver Knight multi-purpose burrs from SSP in here. As you can see, there's a lot of chaff in these burrs uh, that's kind of flown up in the center here. It's kind of a mess in there with all the chaff, but you get, you get the idea. So there's that one. So the next part is to take out this middle screw. Nisha actually sends you a little screwdriver for that. I have misplaced it, but sometimes it loosens a little bit unless you tighten it really tightly. So mine's actually finger loose right now, which isn't a big deal. It's such a long screw that if it's just a little loose, it, it, might, it could rattle, but I've not experienced that. I've read re other users say that happens unless it's super tight. But anyway, you take out this long screw right here, this bolt, and then all you have to do is bloop, you pick out that bottom burr carrier and that's what it looks like right there. So again, chaff is kind of everywhere uh, because we didn't RDT. This is their style of declumper, which is metal and it's kind of built in. But as you can see, it can get caught up with the static. So those are just little chaff and fine particles that kind of got collected there, uh, which will stay there until the next grind, which is kind of frustrating. But the only way to really get those out is to use some sort of bellow system or to like brush it out or your next grind, it's gonna shoot it out. And then if you're still on filter size, you'll probably just have more chaff build up unless you're using a darker roasted coffee that doesn't have that much chaff, in which case you likely won't get a buildup like this. But this is something that can happen. So to kind of illustrate how much is built up there, we'll, we'll just push it out. Look at that. That was all caught right there in those two little slots. And that was, I mean, there you go. That's all chaff and fines. Whenever I use bellows, I don't actually bellow into my dose. I'll bellow into a separate container and get rid of it. Cause most of the time it's just fines and chaff like this. The issue is because this doesn't have that deionizer, it's going to build up and that can cause an issue in the long run. I have my good old faithful bellows that I bought years ago for my Vario review. It's something I got online. It's like to spray pest stuff and it just t tends to fit on everything. Fits on this as well, creates that and I can bellow. Oh, more came out, look at this. Boom. I kind of have a bellows for, for everywhere. I use this for my AK-43, but I, so I'll pull it off for the niche. I know that there are people who have little thin silicone bellows they found online that they use that can fit flush inside of here. So it just stays with the grinder. So here's the filter burr set and here's the espresso burr set. This one's called the 0151B by Modal. So this one is for espresso, though it can do filter. And then this one is the 151F, so it's made for filter. And so all you have to do if I wanted to switch the burr set is I would just take this new carrier, you would just put that in, easy peasy. You'd put the screw back in and then you would just put this top carrier in like so and you're, you're good to go. Neat is they come from niche already calibrated. Now there have been a lot of reports online that they've come miscalibrated where burr chirp or burr touch is well below zero. I think that's just a misunderstanding on calibration. Calibration is a relative term. So some people calibrate to where zero is burr lock. Some people calibrate to where zero is burr touch, like the first point where burrs touch. The way that Niche views it is the zero is like choking out your any espresso machine. They are doing it so like 10 clicks past zero is where burr lock would happen. I think that's probably what's going on. I didn't have an issue with calibration on mine because I kind of understood that, but there could definitely be variation from machine to machine. It's hard to calibrate them all at factory level. But what is interesting is they have these two burr carriers made so that when you switch the burrs out, it's automatically calibrated to stock calibration. And the way they're able to do that obviously is just by varying sizes of the burr carriers so that as you're twisting it, it has that little extra uh, difference so that the burr thicknesses in the outfall will touch around the same area. So with the filter burr, 
errors. When you put it in, it's kind of where it's supposed to be, essentially. But again, that's not necessarily always the case. That's their goal, which is a nice goal to have, but it seems that to not be working in actuality with, with every grinder. I think that's a really nice idea that when you switch the burrs out with their burr carriers and their burrs that are meant for their motor, it does work. The way that it's constructed, I, I can't foresee it ever being consistently perfectly aligned. Uh, it, it just seems like too loose of a situation. So if you do the marker test, you're likely not getting a clean wipe out of box. And even if you shim it to where it's at, the way that this bottom burr carrier sits just kind of makes me a little wary that it's capable of kind of that hyper alignment you can get on something like the Bratz Avario or on other machines like an EK43 or something along those lines. It still is producing nice coffee, which again, we'll get into more so when I talk about the burrs themselves. Okay, that was a lot of words. We'll just clean these burrs off and toss them back in and we'll continue uh, over to the DF83. All right, next up we have the DF83 version two. Now I made a video on version one that's right there, which I, you know, titled Too Good To Be True. And it's because it was kind of the first grinder that really demystified and made accessible bigger burrs. So for the longest time to get burrs that were bigger than 64 millimeters, you were spending uh, well over a thousand dollars. And this one came out with 83 millimeter burrs for a much cheaper price around, you know, 700 US dollars. With that first one, there were some issues with the declumber with the shoe and they came through and fixed a lot of those. The people at Espresso Outlet, thank you Joe for sending this over, they have worked really hard in order to listen to customer feedback and improve the machines. This one actually comes stock with a plasma generator or a deionizer or ionizer, whatever you want to call it. They've improved the declumper and they have an improved shoot in it as well. These are from a friend of mine who, whom I will link down below in the caption. Now this was made to replace on the original one, so I got these before the V2 came out. Uh, I don't think there's much improvement um, in my experience with that, but if you do have issues, you can always switch. And they, he also gives, you know, some ni really nice options for dosing cups with different forks to hold them. So if you're, you know, into like that black look with that thin cup, I mean, that looks really sleek. Same with a silver and you have the bigger dosing cup, which is nice. It's nice to have third party options to kind of, you know, pimp out your grinder. Duo is relatively light, actually. Like I can pick that up, manhandle it one hand, no issue. This bad boy is quite heavy. Uh, and a big part of that is it has a much more chunky motor inside of it. I mean, that bad boy is big. And it's also a full metal construction. This just feels like a much more solid grinder. If you knew nothing about either brand and you had someone come in and just t like hold these, everyone I believe would say this is a higher quality build. I hate this sticker. I think it is not helpful. It has too big of ticks. I hate to hoff you right now, but the font is still pretty awful. On the original, this did not come with it, this little indicator here. And so people were making third party 3D printed ones, but they come stock now with it, which this is actually really nice. It's very easy to zero your grinder. You can't change the threading, obviously, which the way that you take the top bar off is just by, you know, loosening it all of the way. And that's also how you change the grind size. But what this dial indicator can do is you can zero it by just loosening it and you can put it wherever zero is. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing thing if your zero point is off to the side and not directly in the center. It's better than not having something like that at all. You don't want it flat against the sticker itself because then it can it'll just be more difficult to move. So you want it just kind of above it, floating above it, and that way when you move it, the dial indicator is going to point at your exact position. Obviously, you still have the bellows on top, which I know a ton of people really, really, really despise. I don't really mind bellows. I just use them after I grind. Now, because this has that plasma generator, it's really nice when you grind. So we're gonna do a similar size dose on this as we did on the, on the Niche Duo, and we'll see how this one looks. So again, no RDT, I'm just going straight for it. I'm gonna start with a hot start. Now, one thing that I don't enjoy is there is no anti-popcorn disc in here, which is gonna cause when it grinds up and chaff flies, it can get caught inside the bellows, which can be a little pain in the bootay to clean out. But anyway, let's grind this. So as you can see, even with the ionizer, you're still getting a little bit of spray here. 
but it's not kind of getting all over the grinder as it did on the Duo. So I do think it, it does a much better job than the original DF83 when it comes to that. You don't really, really need the, the RDT. The, I'm using the multi-purpose Burr's Red Speed into, in this one. So this I have found does produce a little bit of extra static whenever I'm grinding than some of the other Burr's do. But regardless, you do get a little bit of spray there. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, you don't have as much clinging to the wall inside. It's not creating as much of an electric field. Um, and it keeps the grinder much more relatively clean. You do have chaff and fines that have collected in here, which again, I, like I said, I don't fi find as a bad thing as long as you can get it out before your next dose. It's hard without bellows to get it out of the niche, and as you saw, there was a lot that came out. There will be a lot that comes out here too, but with bellows, you can get that out pretty easily. So let me go ahead and give this a few taps. So mostly we got fines that came out. So those are some fines. Oh, and then here's the chaff. This is such a shallow cup that it, the air was hitting and blowing it out as you probably saw on the camera. So not much though, about 0 0.1, 0 0.15 gram I would say. Both would benefit from a little RDT, uh, even with the plasma generator. This one again has that 550 watt motor, but again, don't be enthralled by the numbers. It is a much beefier motor and it's part of the reason it weighs so much and um, it, it's a more expensive motor. This runs at about 14, 12 to 1400 RPM. Obviously it'll oscillate as you put different beans in. This one runs at around 530 RPM, so a much slower lower speed rate. There are some speculations online that lower RPM on flat burrs will produce lower fines. That's all speculation and fully based on anecdotal evidence. There is no concrete evidence that this happens. There's more concrete evidence that it happens with cone burrs, not with flats. I will say during my tastes, uh, taste testing of the two, uh, it, it just depended on how I dialed it in. I got equally delicious drinks out of both of these. I think this one is arguably a little easier to align and probably holds alignment a little bit better just because I'm, again, I'm a little wary of the way that this one is kind of constructed inside. Yes, burr changes are a lot easier, but uh, it, it just seems to have sacrificed a little bit of that tolerance, a little bit of that tightness, a little bit of that um, potential alignment when it's doing that. But again, that's some speculation. The marker test helps, but it's difficult to know if under load it retains that type of alignment. And with all the different moving parts in here, maybe it, it, maybe it might not. Anyway, let's go ahead. We'll take this top burr off so you can see how that works. So we have the top, the top bit off where the dial is, and we have the dial indicator. And then we pull off that top burr carrier, which is just right there. Now you do have a little bit of fines that build up around this edge. There is a little silicone gasket there to help seal that off, but it does still get a little bit, as you saw, it wasn't much, but there you have the top. And the, of course, like I said, this is the multi-purpose red speed from SSP. There's barely any retention in here. Again, again, there's a little bit of a ring around the edge. If you're using the bellows, the inside's gonna stay pretty clean and very, very, very minimal retention. This is a, a wave spring, I think is a really nice uh, change from the or original, like where there were springs everywhere in a lot of other grinders. Similar to the, to the niche, the alignment out of box is just okay. It uh, it does the job. You don't have to go around and fiddle with either one of these, really. It'll give you great coffee. But uh, if you want to, you know, increase that extra 10% or so, I would recommend doing the marker test, you know, shimming until you have that even wipe. But I think that if your someone is really scrutinizing your coffee and you're actually taking the grinder apart to look at the burrs, you're probably someone that's looking to pull out all, to squeeze all the juice that you can out of these delicious little beans. All right, now let's get into taste. Now, as you can see, I have eight burr sets here for 83 millimeters. Of course, this all really started once the DF83 came out. There's a bigger demand from SSP, from Hansung, to create some more, and so he's been hard at work creating lots of new burrs for it. Originally, he just had the brew burrs and the high uniformity burrs. So the high uniformity are these, which I talk about at length in my original DF83 video, but I think that these are better than the 64 millimeter HUs. You may say, well, duh, they're bigger. Bigger doesn't mean better. Bigger does mean higher potential probably, but even that is, who knows. These perform better with filter and they give just, a, I think, a, a better tasting, sweeter, cleaner espresso. For the elegant modern drinker, if that makes sense, not, not someone that's chasing, you know, the super high clarity, the super acid bombs, just all over, they're looking for the, the most ideal balance in a cup of espresso that you can get. I think the HU is providing that. I think the SSP uh, lab suites here are giving you a more pronounced acidity, although I do, again, I believe it's a very 
balanced cup. I think this one tames the acidity a little bit more than, th than the Lab Sweets do, and it allows for kind of a more elegant coffee drinking experience. We won't really dive too deep into these since I already kind of talked about them at length in the other video. One that's not represented here is the 83 millimeter Ital Milbers. They're currently housed in my DF83, which is packed up and ready to be shipped to one of my Patreon members. I'm about to start giving grinders away like once every two to three weeks on there, so be sure to check out my Patreon. I have my shipping set up already, and I'm ready to start liquidating all these grinders I've been hoarding. Just for you all, for those people on that Patreon, that would be fantastic to come and join, because using the Patreon money, I get to buy grinders, and then I can give it back to the people who essentially funded them. So yes, that means that this will be going up there in the near future, but I have a lot of other grinders to kind of get through first with the DF64 series, with the SK40, with the FAMO book, with the uh, DF83, with uh, some espresso machines, etc. So the Italmo burrs do a solid job. They, you know, get the job done, but I do think that the new burrs, which come in the DF83 V2, I think are a step up. I think that they just are more consistent, they give a bit more of a vibrant cup, and they're just a little bit more interesting. These are a little bit more modern in their cup profile than the Italmil counterparts, although the geometry is very similar. There seems to be just a slight difference there. That being said, I don't think the majority of us is going to really tell a cup to cup difference. I do think these are a little brighter, but for the most part, if you're using a darker bean, I don't think you're going to tell much of a difference. If we're using lighter coffees, there will likely be a slight difference there, especially if you're, you know, someone that's aligning your grinder and really pouring over your coffees. I enjoy them over the stock espresso Mazer burrs for espresso, but again, I think that it's because I prefer a little bit more of a modern style of espresso. These do almost as good of a job on filter. Uh, they're very close uh, in their in their capability and their cut profile to the filter burrs from Mazer. So these do a good job. I might lean Mazer just a little on filter, but not massively. I think they present a nicer cup, a more balanced acidity, and they give you a nice sweetness as well. Now when you look at these, they don't look very different from the 151B. There are more aggressive pre-breakers on this, and it looks as if the, let's see, the finishing teeth seem to be a little more shallow and a, lot, and a less aggressive, which is obvious because with espresso, they need to be more aggressive to kind of powderize it. These will not go to a, to a grind setting where you can hit nine bar with like any coffee. Now these filter burrs actually perform quite well. I enjoy them. They're not as clear or, or they don't give as much flavor separation as a multi-purpose from SSP. These I would equate to the O Gen 2 burrs that I helped produce. I think these for filter are giving you something similar to that. You can push extraction on it. They give you nice juicy cups. They give you some decent clarity. Uh, and it's just a really easy to dial in filter coffee. You can kind of just set it and forget it when you're doing filter. And it's going to give you a nice good cup of coffee. You can do sprovers with them. And I've read some people that have done turbos. I've not tried turbo shots. It was hard enough to raise any pressure going close to chirp. So I just didn't feel like doing it. But purportedly you can do kind of six bar espresso with the filter burrs, though I don't necessarily recommend that. These are the stock espresso burrs on the Niche Duo, and this is the Mazer 151B. These actually give me a more robust bodied shot than the Niche Conical did. I get creamier mouthfeels from these burrs than I did from the Niche 63. I think it's because the 63 Coney gives such a skewed distribution, I'm just, you know, playing around here, uh, that it's giving a more un imbalanced extraction. So you can get some tart, sharp acidity from the 63s with a weirdly un imbalanced body. And it's because the kind of that, that distribution of particles. Again, that dichotomy of cone equals body for flat equals fruity. That's not a true thing. Uh, they both can do both, essentially. I'm always looking for a, some sort of floral element or some sort of nuance in it. These kind of give you a more blended cup, though the, it, it is a much nicer cup, in my opinion, than the Niche Zero or than the majority of cones on the market will give you. The, the espresso is going to give you the most chocolatey and creamy out of all of these. I would say it, it, it's even more so than the Italmil 83 millimeter burrs. Uh, and so out of all of them, this one's going to kind of give you that most traditional profile. Now, now what's interesting is Joe at Espresso Outlet is also starting to offer these filter focused burrs from the same company from Better Grinding. They have a similar geometry to the multi-purpose, meaning there's a lot more pre-breakers, like a lot more, and that's going to give you a slower feed into the final crushing phase. These are honestly not even light pre-breakers. Normally pre-breakers are much bigger like these, and what that's going to do is it's going to dictate kind of the flow of the beans into those finishing teeth, but these are, it's kind of like you're skipping to the second phase and then you have finishing 
finishing teeth. So this is like a two-phase burr, as opposed to a three-phase burr like the Lab Sweets here. This is gonna kind of give you a filter coffee that is kind of like, straddling between one of these or the Mauser 151F and the multi-purpose. It's maybe a slight step up from the Gen 2 Oed burrs. They have a really big outfall. There's a big gap in the edges here. So you're not really gonna get powder in order to do espresso with it, though you could probably force them to do sprovers, maybe even turbos if you're okay with a little chirp, but they do a good job. I think it's one of those things where if you're wanting filters focused burrs, you could probably just buy these and be happy without having to shell out the three or 400 bucks for the SSPs. You know, some like a second team, you know what I mean? They do a good job and I think maybe the majority probably won't care about that step up in difference. I, I think it's a pretty big step up, but I know that probably the majority and the majority of coffee we're drinking at home, it's probably not gonna be worth that extra few hundred bucks to get the SSP. So I do think these are like a JV honorable mention to the multi-purpose. So we also have here the SSP Lab Suite. So these are essentially trying to clone the 80 millimeter Lab Suite burrs that Didding uh, was famous for, this cast burrs. So these are made out of cast iron. And so you have one that's red speed coated and one that's not. The target with these is to give you a, a good acidity while maintaining a heavy sweetness. So sweetness is kind of the ideal cut profile with these burrs while, while not diminishing the presence of the acidity. So it's trying to give you a structured cup with a lot of sweetness, it's a good body, and while maintaining a zingy acidity. And I think they do a really good job. On both the multi-purpose and the lab suites, I have preferred the uncoated versions. I have found that they've produced uh, brighter cups. I put both burr sets into both of these and did side by sides and switched burrs did side by sides. I had the red speed multi-purpose here, the non-red speed here, and then I switched them. I did pour over with the same grind size on each and every time the one that had the red speed was a longer drawdown and muted a lot of that intense acidity that I was able to get from the uncoated. Now that was doing the same grind size so obviously you could probably tailor around with the red speed in order to emulate that of the Silver Knight. Coating gives you a longer life but for a home barista that doesn't really matter. This is more for a cafe environment though they do look really daggum pretty. I mean if I put this on fire I bet you I'm gonna have some like elvish writing show up or something but the cups what matters and uh, we can we can go a second place all right I was a little disappointed with the v1 cast burst from SSP I think the v2 were a whole lot better and he's actually working on a third iteration now that are more espresso friendly for 64 millimeter but I think he has like kind of nailed the recipe now for it and I really enjoy the 83 lab sweets I think they do a fantastic job for filter with kind of a catch-all profile where it's hitting sweetness a really nice balance of sweetness acidity and body without kind of favoring one over the other. If it does favor maybe even sweetness, that perception is really loud with these burrs. I would say a DF64 with the 64 millimeter multi-purpose burrs for the most recent iteration from Hansung are going to compete pretty well with the 83 version. So if you have a DF64 with MP and you're like, I want more clarity, I don't think moving up to the 83 to get the multi-purpose is going to really improve that perception for you, especially if you have like something like a Zerno or a P64 where alignment is like mm, chef's kiss. Those are probably doing better even than the 83 millimeter. It's hard to do a taste testing with all of these burrs, uh, especially because there's two different grinders. They have two different RPMs. They have two different motors. They have two different uh, alignments, setups, builds, etc. And so I'm going based off of a lot of the tasting that I've done over the past few weeks. I had my friend Rui Pedroza over, who is the Portuguese barista champion, who helped me with some tasting as well, especially between the multi-purpose burrs on both of these. This grinder is like 639 US dollars. I checked before I filmed. This is about 676, of course, with this year shipping from UK, so it depends on where you're at in the world. And then when you buy these burrs, they tend to be like 400, 350 US dollars for the SSP burrs. So then when you add that on, you're over the thousand dollar threshold. With this one, if you add it on, you're well over a thousand if you're not in the UK because of the import tax and because of shipping. With DF, they have distributors kind of around the world. Joe kind of handles North America. There's someone named Frankie who handles kind of Australia. And there's, um, I can't remember who does it in Europe, but they're kind of all over. And I've actually never had to pay an import tax for these grinders, I don't know why that is. So which to get? You're in the market for an 83, you don't want the 64 for whatever reason, you don't wanna spend the extra money for like a Zerno, so you're in this camp. 
cool. I think it all comes down to personal preference, honestly. So with this one, you don't have that plasma generator. You are gonna get some mess with static. You should probably use RDT. And as I said, I do have an issue with the like cracked beans flying up and they can kind of get stuck on this collar, especially if you use RDT, then that water kind of makes it even stickier and a lot more will stick up here. And so that can be kind of annoying. With that little plastic feeding bit inside, you also can get some kind of stuff stuck there as well. You need to make sure you're cleaning it. Um, and then you can have kind of build up at that chute, which can be annoying. But again, these are issues that most every grinder faces. It just depends on if you're willing to put a bellows on it or not, especially at that price point. I think they did a good job lowering it. I just hope they offer up more burr carriers so that people can outfit their own burrs to to hit this. But I think those filter bursts from Mazer do a great job with filter. The espresso bursts don't do a great job with filter. They do much better at filter than the Niche Zero. So if you want a one burr catch all, that can work. I would actually recommend getting the stock burr from the DF83 though, if you're gonna put one burr in here, again, it'll avoid your warranty. This one, of course, you have a much heftier grinder. You have the plasma generator. It's a little less messy. You can do RDT on this and it makes it even cleaner. If you're in a higher humidity area, then you really probably don't ever need RDT with this because it does such a nice job. Dialing on this is easy. It's unlimited either way. Uh, I think the dialing ring is a little bit more intuitive on the Niche Zero, but it does stop at like 70. So if you wanted to go really coarse for whatever reason, you're kind of just flying by the seat of your pants. Over here, you do have numbers up to 90, but you can of course go further than that. You're flying by the seat of your pants. If I had to choose between the two, personally, I'm probably leaning towards a DF83 only because I am very anal on keeping my burr chamber clean and the amount of times I've had a lot of chaff and fines caught up in here or I've had to beat up, oh, that all just came out. It kind of will get caught in that little two, two area. Now I've read online there are people who swear they don't have any retention at all and I, I'm not trying to invalidate their experience, but that's just not been the case. I get a lot of this chaff kind of caught up there. Yes, retention is minimal, chaff weighs very little, so it's probably only about 0.2 grams, 0.3 grams. But when that gets exchanged, I urge you to try chaff on its own. Try to save some chaff and taste it. And then also try to brew a cup that has the chaff still in it and a cup without the chaff in it. And tell me you don't tell a difference. You get a drier, papery, kind of tea-like taste to it. When I say tea, I mean like old green tea kind of taste. It's a very weird, unpleasant taste in my opinion. I feel like there's more of a, a, a great modding community of people who make cool accessories for this. And you can grind direct into portafilter. I think on the Niche Zero, someone made a, a stand for it. I don't think it's compatible or it may not be compatible with the Duo, but I'm sure someone will at some point. But this comes with the forks already installed and a portafilter fits very snugly right in between those little rubber grips. We don't ever grind without a collar. So you put that collar on there and boom, you're grinding direct into portafilter with the funnel on it. This one, you don't have that workflow option. You're grinding into the cup and then the cup fits you pull it out. So it does fit without a collar. I mean, but I don't really care about that balance because I'm always putting a collar on because you should be WDTing your shots. So. All right, so that's about it. I hope that you enjoyed today's video. If you did, I would ask that you would hit the like and the subscribe. It helps the channel a whole lot and it helps me you know, to be motivated to keep moving forward. Again, I've said this many times, but I work a full-time job outside of this. So this is kind of you know, a passion project that I'm pushing forward to doing and I really enjoy doing it and your support means the world to me. So thank you very much. If you have any thoughts or comments, leave them below. Let's chat there. If you have any questions about these burrs, because I did run through them pretty quickly, let me know. Uh, we'll see which one is the ring that rules them all for you uh, because I think that's really important. Uh, you want to find the right thing for you. Don't feel the need to go to 83, but if you do, these are two actually both good options. And I'm, I, I think that I think you can't go wrong with either one with the improvements they made on the DF83. And I think the niche, uh, the workflow is good. We're all about squeezing out the minutia, I know, but also we need to be budget minded, budget friendly. So keep all that in mind. Hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope that you brew something tasty today. Cheers.